the way you see me now, surrounded by this lush, extravagant, flamboyant beauty, is how I see the world. I know that my paintings have work to do. My name is Jane Lillian Vance, and this is my work. For 30 years, I have traveled to hard, difficult, remote places in this world, and I have done so to help me make these paintings. These paintings tell stories, and what I know is that these stories are bridges, conduits, and they take us from our home to such difference. Now our bridges have to cross not creeks and rivers, but oceans, oceans that divide us by culture, by ignorance, by suffering. Let me tell you a story. The first painting I would like to show you is called A Tiger Dreams Her Pilgrimage, an old-fashioned word, her life as a pilgrimage, a path with meaning. And in this painting, the tiger sets off on the course of her journey, which is serpentine in its shape because dream logic is like that. It moves in that curvilinear calligraphic way not the right and left of our daytime road logic. This path is lined with scales from raw silk I bought in the south of India, clipped one at a time to emphasize this serpentine freedom. And so the path goes curvilinearly and the tiger sets off on the course of her dream. And at first the tiger is baffled, she thinks, these thousand, thousand images, they are as if through my windshield, like us when we are traveling in Blacksburg, Virginia. There's the coffee shop, there's the golf course, there's the Skelton Center, separate from us and through the windshield. And she's baffled, why is she seeing these others? She sees, for instance, the scavenging, the scavenging vultures who are picking at the carcass of an old water buffalo. Why? Why focus on that? She sees the bear who has been captured and whose muzzle is enwrapped with these chains and the whipping man who owns the bear who makes it dance. She sees the large pot and the hand whose fingerprints are in this mud pot the lime, acid like the sun, the camel who screams because in her desert it has not rained for a dozen years. She sees the ascetics, too languid, too passive, sitting on their skinny hips, waiting for God in the fire, as if by waiting you ever find anything. She sees the woman who, with her open legs and her breasts spilling out of her sari, is too inviting, too accessible. She sees the bull in a field of dead cotton. Imagine that your sustenance is dead cotton. What is it like only to feed in that dry, pitiful way? She sees the cobra who carries its baby its yolky slip in this orb in her mouth, and she can rise up with no appendages and take her baby to safety at the merest vibration. She sees a mother with a child. She sees a village condemned to violence by this intrusion. She sees these marauders who come, it is not their village, but they come to claim with sword. They behead, they take. And she sees a man who looks, if you think of the angle of his vision, through a teacher's mind at this sight and realizes that by fighting back in similar measure, you become only like them. She sees the same man in deep thoughtfulness 
tiger striped this time, a child just learning, a woman of the woods who holds a rhododendron rather than the Asian lotus. She sees a pony whose pulse is heightened because it knows it is pursued by wolves. All of these and a thousand other images she sees, not knowing why. And finally, at the end of her track, there she is again, the same tiger holding what looks like this child's sucky cup. The Tibetans call it a norbu. It is a wish-fulfilling gem. It means here, now, what you are thinking, what you are seeing, what you are dreaming is not accidental. It has significance. It has meaning. And at the end of her dream, she is the same tiger, but now she is awake. And that is all the Tibetans have ever meant by their word Buddha, Buddha mind, to be awake. But the question is, and the paintings must ask the questions, awake to what? Awake, the painting answers, to your own sympathies with what seem like other people's problems, other settings. What the tiger wakes to is the knowledge that all of these moments and other characters in seemingly foreign narratives, those are predicaments that she herself now occupies in some way in relation to someone in her life right now. She is the dead cotton. She is the bull trying to take sustenance. She is the maternal poisonous snake. She is the marauded village. She is the one who comes in. She is the contemplative. She is the scavenger. She is the camel suffering drought. She is the sun as acid as lime. In relation to someone in her life right now, she is each of these predicaments. Not just one of them, not just one or two roles. She is every predicament. And the moment she realizes her sympathy with everything she has ever seen, she is awake to her compassion for situations that seemed so foreign to her. And she needs no longer to waste her spirit and her conceptual mind with judgment. Instead, she understands the similarity she has with everything that has looked so different. The stories my paintings tell make those bridges. They include and embrace and enfold and invite in rather than discard. That is why in so many of my paintings you will see not just the fabulous and the voluptuous and the sumptuous and the natural, though you will see much and in exquisite detail because in my storytelling you must have craftsmanship. This is not hurried. This is not abstract. This is not random or accidental. It is knowledgeable craftsmanship with which I paint these stories because my details must be correct in order for my story and my knowing to be true. What you will see are also cases of anguish and of disfigurement and of terror. You will see a Zambian child who has suffered sexual abuse. You will see a deer who was startled in a field when a murderer dropped a dead girl, a student. Uh, you will see so many moments of anguish and suffering. You will see an HIV positive mother. You will see bovine face children in developing countries who have stopped hoping. Why, when I have access to these beautiful, gorgeous gardens and mountains upon mountains of flowers, would I include the suffering? Why would I not delete and discard? Because at this moment in history, we have to, with our inclusiveness, with our stories, put to our hearts as if warming a child or a sister or a mother. We must put 
every situation and predicament we see within our fold and grasp and love with our passion and with our talents. You know the old story I hear from so many teachers in Tibet, in the free parts of Tibetan settlements, in the mountains of Nepal, where my documentary, A Gift for the Village, was filmed when one of my paintings was the gift to one of the villages, Domsum, in the west of Nepal. The story I hear from the old monks most often is about the monk who went to the seashore, never having seen the ocean, being startled by the thousand thousand fish at low tide who are flapping desperately. They can't get back to the water. And there's an old arthritic monk and he's picking up one fish at a time and putting it back in that ocean. And the young monk who has just arrived and whose body is whole and who has encouragement and energy and ego says to the old monk, I just came from the hill. Can't you see, even from where you are, can't you understand that there are more situations than you can ever touch, more fish than you will ever rescue? And without missing an arc, without missing a moment, the old monk, with no haste and no anger, says to the student, yes, you're right, more than I can do. But you see this fish, this one fish, to this fish, what I'm doing is everything. Our path has to be like that. Our stories have to encourage all of us that these bridges between difference, these bridges are possible. They are necessary. They are my obligation. They have been my duty since I was two years old. And in my sandbox made with four old railroad ties where creosote bubbled up like accidental India ink in July, and I would break off a splinter of this wood and dip this accidental brush. I began on the maple tree trunk, my earliest canvas, to try to say how connected, how beautiful, how refulgent is this world. And our obligations go further than we may believe. The stories, whichever they are in our path, whether we travel, as I have done, to the mountains of Nepal, among the Tibetans, in Sri Lanka, in the heart of India, in the desert of India, collecting old, beautiful, cultural detail, visual, objects, stories, gorgeous things, fossils and tapestries ruining in the corner of a haveli, whether they are from our travels or our interactions now, our stories must cross. Our art must be this arcing out. In the seventh century, Shantideva, the current Dalai Lama's favorite poet of all time, talked about bridging. He said, I must be a guide, a lamp, a boat, a bridge. Centuries later, Leonardo da Vinci, talking about architecture and reliance, not self-reliance, said in his diary, sitting in an old cafe, clouded in its armpits by the dew of mildew and drinking his wine. He said, my thinking none of us would hear. My favorite architectural shape is the arch because it is two weaknesses which lean together to create a strength. The bridges I'm talking about that I know my students have begun commerce on are these arcings, these beautiful shapes out to difference. I, I refuse to paint what is only ornamental, what is only beautiful, what can only be with its wall to a mausoleum-like uh, gallery. I refuse to paint what is 
a hot commodity with a signature to be owned. I need to tell my students stories and I need for them to believe that they have a place in this world where their stories will light up someone else's path, a guide, a boat, a bridge, and that they will be the other component to someone else's weakness.